Hello, everyone. I appreciate you all taking time out of your busy day today to spend some time with us as we go through uh, Microphone Basics. I'm sure it will be worth your uh, while. And on that note, we'll get started. Uh, a little bit about myself. I am a uh, regional sales manager with TOA Canada. I cover the prairies as well as Atlantic Canada. So a little bit about the agenda, what we're going to cover today. We'll look at different types of microphones, microphone pickup patterns and the differences between them. A little bit about technology, we won't go too in depth, but some fundamentals that you should be aware of. How to select the microphone, and that kind of relates to applications where certain microphones perform better, uh, where uh, others don't perform as well, and some of the issues that choosing the incorrect microphone may pose to you. So that, uh, at the end of that, actually, we're going to go through a brief little overview of the TOA offering when it comes to microphones. So we'll start very basic, is how does a microphone work? Well, like a loudspeaker, the microphone is a transducer. In other words, an energy converter. It senses acoustic energy, which is sound, and translates it into electrical energy, amplified and then sent to a loudspeaker. So the sound pickup of a microphone transducer should emerge from the speaker transducer with no significant change in colorization. So basically what goes in is what goes out. So in the application of let's say a teacher, Mr. Brown, Mr. Brown speaking through a microphone, which would go to an amplifier and have a speaker, should still sound like Mr. Brown. Uh, what can potentially change is, is some of the frequency characteristics of that microphone. But that's kind of how a uh, microphone uh, works, and we'll get a little bit more into it moving forward. So there's two types, main types of microphones uh, that you're commonly uh, run into, which is a dynamic and condenser. And we'll look at the difference between those two uh, right now. So a dynamic microphone. A dynamic microphone uh, can be considered uh, similar to a, a conventional loudspeaker. So it works very much the same, just in a different form factor. Uh, both have a diaphragm or a cone. Uh, of course, different sizes from a loudspeaker to a microphone. Uh, they have a voice coil, a long coil of wire that's wrapped around. Both have magnetic systems with the coil uh, and its gap. The difference is how they are used. So that's a big difference in a microphone to a loudspeaker. With the speaker current uh, flows from, sorry, with the speaker current from the amplifier flows through the coil. The magnetic field created by current flowing through the voice coil interacts with the, with the magnetic field of the current's magnet, forcing coil and attached cone to move back and forth. So as that energy uh, is being sent from the amplifier through that voice coil, now that speaker transducer starts moving back and forth, creating sound. A microphone works in exactly the opposite way. The sound hits the diaphragm and moves through that voice coil. There's the uh, magnet in there. There's your coils, magnet here, coils here. And that signal comes out uh, in the form of uh, electricity, per se, very low voltage, and out to the input into your mixer. So it works very similar to... Uh, a loudspeaker. A condenser is a little bit different. A condenser or capacitor microphones are lightweight membrane and a fixed plate that acts uh, as a opposite size of the capacitor. Sound pressure against this uh, small polymer film causes it to move. This move changes the capacitance of the circuit creating and changing electrical output. One thing to be wary of and be aware of if you look at the uh, diaphragm here, we get the plate and the audio signal output is that this important uh, part right here, which is the battery and or power supply. So on a condenser microphone, it requires power to work, usually up to about 48 volts, which is considered phantom power. So that's definitely one thing to, to be aware of. If you ever run into hooking up a microphone, you can't get any output or anything like that. Chances are it's probably, you know, uh, as long as your cables are good, chances are it requires phantom power. And that means usually on the mixer, uh, there'll be a button to hit for phantom power, or in the software, there'll be a setting to, to get phantom power to that microphone. So it's one thing to definitely be aware of. Condenser microphones are, are preferred for their very uniform frequency response, so very accurate in, in their uh, reproduction of sound. Oh, one moment. Uh, the WebEx is doing something here. Sorry about this. 
for some reason, sometimes when new people come on, it's taking your role. <laughs> oh, it's going to present her? Back. Pardon? It, it, yeah, it, it for some reason when someone logs in, it, it took your presenter role. <laughs> but you're back online. Okay, so the next person that joins uh, can take over for me. <laughs> uh, so again, uh, condenser microphones are preferred because they're, they're, they're great for each response. And the ability to respond with clarity to transient sounds. The low mass of the diaphragm permits uh, extended frequency response uh, with the nature. So, uh, as well as standing low frequency pickup. The resulting sounds natural, clean, clear, with excellent transparency and detail. So, generally, they're more of an accurate solid microphone uh, than a dynamic. Comparison between dynamic and condenser. Just rule of thumb when we look between a dynamic condenser is dynamics generally can handle a higher SPL, so loud environments. So let's say in a, a kick drum, a microphone for a kick drum, very loud, robust, a lot of sound pressure level. Generally, that's going to be a dynamic microphone because it can handle a higher SPL. Dynamics are generally because there's less electronics in them as opposed to a condenser, they're more durable. So a dynamic can, is a little bit, can withstand a little bit more abuse like maybe a school gym where it's being dropped or abused or a stage microphone, that type of thing. So they're less susceptible to damage from dropping and so on. Generally, they're more inexpensive than a condenser microphone, price-wise. And temperature doesn't affect them as much as a condenser. So that's, that's some key points on the dynamic. On the condenser side, as you mentioned, uh, with regards to quality and frequency response, that relates to high sensitivity. So they can pick up something very subtle and quiet. Maybe it's strings, choir, uh, miking of something in, in a house of worship or something that is very quiet and faint. So they have a higher sensitivity level. They are more fragile. So some uh, uh, condensers, you know, you drop them and that could be a one drop replace type of scenario. So again, maybe in a school scenario for a general vocal microphone might not be the, the most uh, wise choice because they do need to handle some abuse in those environments. Lower handling noise, meaning picking up, moving it around. They do require phantom power, as I mentioned. Generally, as a rule of thumb, condensers, because they're a little bit more advanced, can be a little bit more pricey than a dynamic microphone. Wider dynamic range, as I mentioned before, so the frequency response is a little bit wider. And they can be made quite small, so very small for a lavalier or headset style microphone. Those, uh, majority of them, are, are all condenser style microphones. We'll look at polar patterns. So what are polar patterns? So we use polar, polar patterns graphs to illustrate the microphone pickup characteristics. These round plots show the relative sensitivity of the microphone in decibels as it rotates in front of a fixed sound source. And you'll see a picture on the next slide of what it looks like. Plots of the microphone polar response are usually shown in various fragrances. The most common directional microphones exhibit a heart-shaped polar pattern. And as a result, they're called cardioid microphones. So looking at some examples, and you'll see the bottom right, uh, this is a pole, kind of a polar pattern or, or pickup pattern of this microphone. So an omnidirectional microphone picks up sound from just about every direction equally. The work, work sorry, the work around a well-pointed, away, work just as well pointed away from the microphone or is that at the rear of the microphone? even if the distance is real. However, even the best models tend to have a little bit of drop off in the, in the rear side of the microphone, or it tends to be a little bit duller. You lose a little bit of a higher frequency, frequency response at the rear of the microphone. Uh, the size of the mic has a direct bearing on the pattern of the mic as well, most notably at higher frequencies. Therefore, the smaller the microphone body, uh, the closer the mic will have to be uh, to an omni for full frequency response. So again, in this omni type pickup pattern, this polar response, you'll see that pickup pattern is 360 degrees around this microphone. So if I'm in front of the microphone, you're picking me up. If I'm beside the microphone or behind the microphone, you're picking me up equally and relatively the same amount. As mentioned, you do lose a little bit at the rear of the microphone. A unidirectional microphone is definitely different. You can see from the, uh, the chart here. So directional microphones, uh, just step actually back a little bit on an application point. An omni-type directional microphone, because it is 360 degrees pickup, 
Well, that tends to be used as maybe a lavalier style microphone where it's pinned uh, on your collar or so on. Where, you know, uh, someone walking around in a portable wireless scenario doing public speaking, maybe a house of worship presentation type application. They'll clip that on, on, on under their shirt. And sometimes, you know, the microphone will be pointing up their mouth, sometimes it's pointing down on the ground and, and so on. So an omnidirectional microphone will pick up all the way around. So it gives a little bit better uh, pickup and coverage for the voice because uh, you, we're not quite sure how that microphone is going to be clipped onto that person. So it enables, you know, a good coverage uh, of that person and application. But on the uni style you know, or directional microphones, their designers find best to sound from the front and reject other angles, depending on the, the pattern design. This directional ability is usually the result of external openings and internal passages in the microphone that allow sound to reach both sides of the diaphragm in a carefully controlled way. So that's how, kind of how it's designed and how those, those certain passways can change that polar pattern, whether it's really tight on a cardioid. If you think of a cardioid like kind of like a heart, uh, there's a pointed part of the heart, and then it curves down to the back, which kind of dents in. Sound arriving for the front of the microphone will, uh, will add diaphragm motion, while sound arriving at the side of the rear uh, will cancel diaphragm motion. So you won't have as much pickup and sound energy behind the microphone as the front. Proper understanding of use of directional microphones and their polar patterns can reduce or eliminate feedback and increase isolation sensitive mic applications. So in the application, if we had, let's say, a cargo at our unidirectional style microphone in a lavalier style, and that microphone happened to be pointed down towards a person's feet, then I'm speaking definitely on, on, you know, towards the back of the microphone, you wouldn't get much pickup pattern. But uh, the one problem of, I guess, difference between a uh, omnidirectional, wait, it clicks back, and going back to the unidirectional, is that with the omnidirection, you're picking up all around you. One thing that does, does create uh, a potential for is feedback, because it's picking up sound everywhere. So the potential that it gets that loop by picking up the speaker and creating that feedback loop. A unidirectional cardio style microphone allows you to focus in on the intended uh, pickup area. So if we had a pulpit microphone and I'm standing there talking to an audience, you know, it's not picking up the other side of me, meaning the audience side uh, of the microphone. It's picking up directly to me. So you're really focusing in on my face and what I'm saying instead of what's around me. So there's less chance of feedback and less chance of picking up other noise around me in that uh, environment. So depending on the application, you know, uh, you may want to look at an Omni to pick up general, you know, area, maybe in a boardroom on a boardroom table. An Omni would be great because you just pick up the whole boardroom table. But on, in an application where maybe I'm walking around a school gym, I am a gym teacher, and I'm around a bunch of speakers, there's a high chance of feedback. So having something that focuses right on my mouth, maybe in a head style microphone, in a cardio style, might be a better choice in that application to reduce feedback. So again, this is a, a topical look at the pickup pattern. So here's your omnidirectional pattern looking straight down it. So here's your microphone and around it is the pattern right there. So as you see, there's a little dropout at the rear of the microphone, but fairly constant all around that 360 degrees. Looking at a cardioid style microphone, this is how you get the cardioid name. Again, you've got good pack up, pick up in the front, but as you start to get to the side, you start dropping off until you get to the rear. There are different styles and tighter patterns of cardioid, like hypercardioid, where this is really narrow, so it has very, uh, very much increased side rejection. So on to this point, you know, if, you're, if, if you have one person talking in front of the microphone, another person talking at nine degrees off, there is the, uh, the distance dB rule that comes into play, where distance doubled, you lose 6 dB. So as you're getting away from that distance, you're losing uh, that 6 dB. So the person at 90 degrees away from the person in front of the microphone will be 6 dB quieter. So that's one point to understand about these cardioid patterns. But as you can see, when you look at microphones, depending on your application, how you're, you're, you're tr what you're trying to pick up or isolate, you know, looking at these polar charts will come in handy. The other key thing just to quickly look at is frequency response. As a speaker has a certain frequency response characteristic in the spec sheet, so does microphones. So in this application, it's 20 hertz, low frequency base, 
up to 20 kilohertz. So that's your high frequency. And this sample microphone, we, you see, okay, we've got a, a pretty good drop off at about 80 hertz down below. So it doesn't uh, recreate too much low frequency. So let's say miking a kick drum or miking a bass amplifier, probably not the best microphone. Fairly flat response until we get up to about 3 or 4K. Then it boosts up a little bit. So we get a little bit increase there. So that helps with a little, uh, some of the intelligibility of, of a vocal mic per se. So this is probably a typical response of a vocal microphone where we don't need the extended low frequency response when it's flat through the mid bands and a little bit of uh, boost in, in the intelligibility frequencies. So it's nice to look at uh, the, the frequency response of a microphone when looking at a selection or potential solution. Proximity effect. So approximate effect is a change in the frequency response of a microphone having a directional pickup pattern that produces an emphasis on lower frequencies and sibilance. So a lot of microphones do have uh, this proximity effect. And if you ever get a chance next time you're playing with a microphone, you know, set it up to, to pick up you at a certain uh, volume level and get right on the microphone. Then kind of move away from the microphone, maybe a foot away from the microphone. You notice the low frequency really drops off. And you'll notice this when you see singers performing and so on. Sometimes they're right on that microphone, sometimes they're off. A lot of times it is to, to get that low frequency or proximity effect uh, that takes place once you get very close to that microphone. So it allows uh, your, your voice to get a lot fuller sounding. So that's something to be aware of. If you're getting a little bit too much low frequency, then maybe stepping back from that microphone will, will alleviate some of that issue. Also, with regards to sibilance, if we look at the microphone, sibilance is, is the high frequency clarity, per se, of the microphone. As you move off axis, you lose a little bit of that as well. Uh, and that has to do with proximity effect. So it's more of the usage of the microphone and being aware of the characteristics that they do have. Feedback. I mentioned this earlier. So if we look at what feedback is, we'll look at this picture over here. So we've got a microphone on a stand. And potentially, let's say I'm speaking. So we have the original audio I'm talking right here. It's going into the microphone. The microphone voice coil or diaphragm is moving, creating electrical signal that's going all the way down the cable into the mixer amplifier, which is amplifying it, and out the speaker. Now the speaker is transmitting that same sound. And, and the way this is just right now, now you have potentially that microphone here picking up that original sound. So what do we have here is we have a, a loop. So now that, you know, the, the, the original sound going in through the system amplified is going back to the microphone and it's in a, continu a, a continuous loop, which is feedback. And everybody's heard that high pitch squeal when someone gets a little bit too close to a, uh, with a microphone to a speaker, that's feedback. Never desirable uh, in any type of public, uh, uh, public performance, whether it's singing or public speaking. So to alleviate that, first thing we to look at sometimes is the pattern. So going back to the polar pattern, maybe in this application, well, in this application, we don't want an omni-style microphone. We have something that has a little bit of rejection to where that speaker is located. In this, in this application, you know, Audio 101 says don't have a speaker pointing at a microphone, but it's just showing, you know, that loop. But take, looking at a polar, uh, polar pattern of a microphone, they say, hey, you know, there is a speaker in this general area. Maybe I need some of the very narrow cardioid pattern to just focus on a certain area where that person is speaking and have good rejection to the left and right where the speakers may be. So again, just look at it. When you're in a room and you're having feedback issues, does the mic see that speaker? Is the mic pointing near it? Uh, sometimes we're running applications where uh, maybe the stage jets out a little bit in front of where the speakers are on the on the sidewalls on the left and right. So in essence, that microphone is a little bit in front of that speaker. So you know the mic does see the speaker. So we might want to look at maybe changing that, bringing the speakers ahead of the stage a little bit, or bringing the microphone a little bit back. Again, as I mentioned, with polar related, the polar pattern is look at microphones with rejection at the side or rear uh, or at the rears. Also, reducing distance between the source and the microphone. So that, that comes into play is how the gain structure of your microphone is set up. Is it set up that you have to be right on the microphone, be picked up to be heard? 
or do you turn the gain up a little bit louder or higher, increase the gain, so I can be away from the microphone maybe a foot? Some people like to be, you know, don't like to be running the microphone, they like to have that distance. But when you have that distance, that means you're turning up the gain starts of the microphone, meaning that you're increasing the chance that it can pick up feedback from the speakers. So in a highly, you know, uh, uh, feedback situation, you may want to say to the presenter, people speaking in that application or in that installation, move a little bit closer to the microphone and boost your gain, uh, just so, uh, or sorry, reduce your gain, so you don't have that microphone trying hard or, you know, uh, picking up the audio from the speaker in that room. It's playing with gain structure and distance from person speaking or source the microphone can reduce feedback as well. How do they sound? Well, an Omni mount, uh, it's going to capture more ambient noise. So Omni mounts are great for, let's say, over a choir uh, or an or, or, or textural band or something like that where you want to capture a general area, boardroom, that type of thing. Because you've got to you know, pick up sound all the way around. Uh, Cardio will capture the direct sound. So let's use an example. You could put an Omni microphone on a drum set, one microphone. So you're going to pick overall that drum set. But you may not have the definition of adding a cardio and putting a cardio on every one of the pieces of the drum set. So on all the cymbals and the various toms and snares, that's where you'd probably use a cardio because you're just picking up that individual piece. So on a choir, you may have an audio mount overall and to cover, you know, the cover and pick up most of the choir. But if there's a soloist there, you probably have a cardio in there set up for the soloist to focus in on them. A hypercardioid will capture direct sound at a further distance. So, as I mentioned, the cardio is kind of, you know, looks like a hard type scenario. There's different versions of those cardios which really shrink, uh, shrink the side coverage and shoot the distance away from the microphone or increase that distance away. So, you may see them in sporting events, a very long cylindrical, sometimes they're two or three feet long. That's a, a, a hypercardioid or super hypercardioid. So, it's going to have good resistance to the side, but that polar pattern is really narrow. So, you're going to pick up audio for a long distance away. Maybe you're trying to pick up uh, a sporting personality at a football game or something like that, or maybe it's good for interviews. Sometimes you'll see them on, on, on movie cameras and so on to try to, when they're doing interviews, that pick up you know, someone at a distance. So that covers some of the microphone basic characteristics there. Uh, we'll move on to some characteristics for wireless transmission and wireless microphones. So when it comes to wireless microphones, there's generally two types of transmission, uh, transmission types available, RF, radio frequency, and infrared, IR. So radio frequency is a rate of oscillation in the range of about 30 kilohertz to 300 gigahertz with correspondence to frequency of electrical signals normally used to produce and detect radio waves. So the radio type of scenario. The, the frequency we use in, in, in wireless microphones is not generally what you're going to see on a radio broadcast, but the, the fun, uh, fundamentals are there. In infrared, it's infrared radiation is electromagnetic radiation. R is an energy similar to visible light, but with a longer wavelength. So infrared is what you'd use on general remote controls. So it's point source. So you use your remote to change the volume on your home stereo, your home surround receiver. That's transmission of, of information that way. We can also transmit microphone signal that way. The difference between the two application-wise is that RF generally will go through walls. So you can penetrate walls uh, and go you know, a greater distance. Infrared, you know, your remote does not work too good when you go into the kitchen and it's through a wall. So infrared doesn't penetrate through those type of obstacles. So really it's you have to be in, in the room that you're using. Where that comes into play, maybe, you know, uh, quite commonly, is voice up in classroom. RF is used uh, in schools, but more commonly IR is, because once you leave that classroom, that microphone, there's no chance of it transmitting anymore. So if there's an incident and you're talking about Bobby outside the classroom, there's no chance that the teacher maybe forgot to turn his microphone off and something gets transmitted within the classroom. Also, infrared, because it is confined to the room, generally is a more inexpensive version of encryption. So when we get into corporate conferencing systems and, and things like that, or town halls, infrared is, is safer because no one can listen in on infrared, where 
RF, you know, it is transmitted. It goes outside the wall, so someone could potentially, uh, you know, link onto that. So that's a little bit about RF and infrared. Receiver types. So when we look at receiver types uh, of wireless microphones, so some big differences. The first thing is the number of channels uh, it has allows for the number of systems that can be used in one install. In addition, with more channels, you can move away from interfering, sorry, interfering channels. So what that really means is when you look at a wireless system, usually you'll see something that says 12 systems, 16 systems, four systems. That's one spec. The other one will say, it could say 200 frequencies. They're two different things. The systems spec basically says, again, as this first point mentions, is how many units or wireless, wireless systems, so that's receiver microphones, can be used in one building. So if it's 12, then, then the research has been done and said, okay, you can use 12 in this school with any chance of frequencies interfering with each other in a certain band, in a certain range of frequencies. So again, if you're going into a school and you're using RF uh, in some of the classrooms and in the cafeteria and maybe in the gym, and you happen to have a system that says four systems uh, simultaneously and you get eight, well, chances are you might have some issues with uh, frequency uh, crossing over, interference, and so on. So you have to pay attention to that. The other thing in more metropolis areas where you have lots of competing RF signals, having an increased amount of frequencies in general available, like i.e. 200 frequencies, will allow you to increase the odds that you can find a certain frequency that works for you without interference. And a lot of the higher end receivers will have frequency scan functionality where you hit a button on the receiver and it'll scan all the RF frequencies that that unit is geared up for and suggest the one has the least amount of frequencies. So two, two kind of things to be aware of when it comes to receiver types and fragrances. Next, we'll look at a little bit of technology that relates back to these fragrances and the, and the re reception of them. So this is diversity, space diversity, and true diversity. Let me just go ahead with this. Uh, go to that, we'll look, start off first with diversity. So diversity is kind of the entry level way uh, or stepping point in a wireless system. So on an economic system, the receiver may have one or two antennas that are physically connected to each other. So all those two antennas, they go back to a common point here. The system has one tuner, so it's one tuner that reads those antennas. Now these, uh, these type of systems, entry level systems, can be prone to multicasting. Basically, drop out noise when you have you know uh, you have RF being transmitted without a throughout a room with different waves hitting at different points. There's no special processing going on here. So if there happens to be a dropout in the, the antennas going back to this tuner, there's nothing you can do. But there's no circuit in there to say okay, uh, the signal's better on this antenna, that antenna. You're just adding more coverage here, but not intelligent coverage. So the, again, there's a chance of the dropout there. Kind of the example I use is, you know, years ago when cordless home phones come out, you know, you walk through a hallway and all of a sudden that cordless phone drops out for a minute. You know, there was no intelligibility or intelligence there in processing to deal with uh, noise and multicasting within that room, so you, you run into the dropout scenarios. So this is an inter-level type wireless scenario. Uh, a lot of times, you know, you really want to go up from the diversity because if you're adding a wireless microphone to a scenario or to an application, the reason is because someone wants to be heard. When you have to deal with dropout or anything like that in a presentation or in a house of worship scenario and you can't be heard, it kind of defeats the purpose of the whole system. But budget uh, sometimes uh, only allows for uh, an entry level scenario, so they are, they are available. In more remote areas, maybe where there's not frequency saturation, they perform a little better. But when you're getting to downtown areas and, and metro cores, uh, I would suggest looking at other potential solutions when it comes to receiver types. That next potential would be space diversity. So TV space diversity, what is this? Well, in these systems, we have two antennas, <coughs> excuse me, as I mentioned before, which are not connected and are spaced apart. 
Only one receiver is present, but there is a unique comparator circuit. And that's set between the antennas and the tuner. This circuit monitors the RF levels of one of the antennas. Once the level decreases, so the signal gets low, below a specific threshold, the receiver switches to the other, other antenna uh, in hopes that that's got a stronger signal. This happens continually, so it goes back and forth as it's in operation. The one issue with this circuit uh, uh, is that it doesn't know the condition of the other antenna. So if right now we're on antenna, uh, antenna A, and it senses that starting to get weak, then it switches to antenna B. This system doesn't know the antennas, whether antenna B is stronger or weaker than antenna A. So it's constantly going back and forth. So the result uh, overall is a much more reliable system because it is switching back and forth for looking at signal, but it's blind switching. So sometimes it could switch over here and then that's weaker than right back. So it's definitely an improvement over diversity but again, uh, there could be a potential for some dropouts. <coughs> Excuse me. So the next step up from there to reduce most chances of any kind of interference or dropout is true, true diversity, which is your best solution. So here we have uh, two unconnected and separate antennas, but instead of a single tuner, we now have two tuners. One, one per circuit. So after the tuners, now we have a comparator circuit. Basically, this switch basically looks at the signals via the tuners and intelligently says, okay, this, is th this signal is this strong, this signal is this strong, I'm at 70% here, I'm at 95% here, I'm going to switch over to here. Once it notices that the other tuner may be stronger, then it might switch over to that one. So it's always no it always knows the state of the signal between both these tuners and antennas and switches to that stronger sway, uh, that stronger state. Therefore, again, it knows before switching that it's going to be a better signal and will constantly monitor those two antennas via the, uh, the receiver tuner and, and verify that, uh, again, that it is stronger and that we don't have any dropout. So this is the scenario that's going to reduce most chances of dropout. It's going to give you the reliability you're looking for in certain applications. So True diversity is the key. When comparing microphones, you'll see sometimes you'll see inexpensive microphones and they will say diversity. Remember the key part of diversity is true diversity. There's a big difference between true diversity, two microphones connected to one receiver, to two microphones, to two, sorry, tuner receivers to a comparator. So it's definitely uh, important to realize. Sometimes people get confused when they do see this and again, they see two tuners and the receivers, and they think, well, that means I can have two microphones in this receiver. No, it's still one microphone to receiver, uh, because again, these are both looking for the signal transmitted, being transmitted from that one microphone. So that is sometimes a, a common issue is they see that, and again, I can probably use two microphones here. No, you won't, because they'll be competing with their single transmission to create issues and switchovers and dropouts. So that kind of covers most of the microphone basic uh, terminology, technology, some things to be aware when looking at uh, those systems. Once you get to the end of this presentation, uh, you can bring up any questions that you do have. We'll quickly run through TOA offering when it comes to microphones. And uh, that should probably take maybe another five or 10 minutes. And we'll jump into that right now. First, we'll look at the wired offering. So here's our EM700. It's a boundary microphone. So generally, a boundary microphone is used in the center of maybe a corporate boardroom desk, that type of application. And that being said, it is a omnidirectional omni kind of microphone that picks up all around in that type of room. And it's also a condenser microphone, so it does require that phantom power. So it's going to pick all the way around and requires power. The DM1300, this is a cardioid pickup microphone, so you have pickup in front and around the microphone, but minimal pickup in the rear, and it is a dynamic microphone. The M800 gooseneck microphones, uh, you can use it on a base, or sometimes there'll be shock uh, mounts put into a podium or something like that. This is a cardioid pickup microphone. So it has rejection there. So again, if the house of worship 
and you have people out in front and so on, it's not going to be picking out people there. It's just going to pick up out in front of you. And it is a condenser style microphone. PM660U, this is a dynamic microphone and it is a cardioid. So this one you'll see, you know, at school, general paging areas on a security desk. Uh, lots of, you know, lots of use can happen. It would drop, knocked over, things like that. So it's very robust. And because of that, uh, it's a dynamic microphone. QRM9012, this is a paging microphone. Again, dynamic and cardioid, I believe. Uh, yep, I think that's what it is. But this one is a zone paging microphone. So it allows you to page to 12 different zones. AM600, can we get into an Omni-style pickup pattern with a condenser-style microphone requiring phantom power? So that's some of our wired versions of microphone. We have a whole webinar on the AM1, which is a very unique, and you could, again, do a whole hour on the technology here, but something to be aware is the AM1 real-time steerable array microphone. So this is actually multiple microphones in an array. And there is built-in sensor detects and tracks sounds based upon the distance and phasing from the different microphone capsules throughout that. So it captures voice clearly and continually see, uh, from either side, above or below. So all the way around, basically, it's 180 degrees uh, in front of it. The advantage of this one uh, is it frees the speaker to move around in the vicinity of a, po uh, a podium, turn or tilt their heads without concern of the microphone location. Of course, this does require power, but the power is from this processing unit right here. So it's kind of a unique beast in itself. Uh, it has multiple condenser microphones uh, and processing that controls its pickup pattern inside the processing here. So it's very unique and, and, uh, on its own, but something I wanted uh, you to be aware of when it comes to microphones. And to kind of uh, look at how that uh, it does pick up, and there is a link here via our website when you do a search at TOA can.com for the M1 is it'll actually track where you are moving in front of the microphone. Microphone. So right here we get the AM1, which does pick up 180 degrees in front of it and around it, so like that. So on the video we have a, is a, a battery operated train going around a track, and as you can see, this is the app for this particular microphone. And as it goes around that track, it's following the sound pressure of that microphone. So we're about right here on the track, and that's about where we are here. So the video is pretty neat. neat if you get a chance to look at it. You can see as that train goes around, it'll follow you around in that area and does some, you know, volume conversation and so on. So it's kind of a neat microphone, uh, taking various technologies and pickup patterns and, and so on into a, a digital DSP-controlled microphone. So just wanted you to be aware of that that is a wired microphone. Then we get into our wireless microphone options. We have our Trantec. S4.16 system, which is uh, diversity. So again, entry level style, entry to mid, 12 channels, and that means 12 channels, meaning 12 systems can be used in one uh, particular facility at a time. Our S5.3 Trantec by TOA, which allows uh, 12 channels as well, gets into a true diversity. So we've got an increase in the reliability of the Trantec S5.3. Step up from there is, and again, these are RF on both the Trantec 4.16 and S5.3. RF as well is the 5000 series, where we get up to 16 channels within a facility. And again, just to reiterate that, when you look at our wireless systems, there'll be banks. So you could look at, let's say the part number is a 5000. It's a WM5000 wireless system. You'll always see a, a bank and a number after that. So it could be... F band, G band, H band. So each one of those band is a, is a group of frequencies. So what that means is you can have 16 systems working simultaneously within one of those bands. So you could have 16 systems in H, 16 channels in G, 16 channels or system being used in F. So within that series of 5,000, you could have you know, 32 or beyond working in one particular facility as long as they're in different channel groups, per se. And again, the 5000 series is a true diversity and does add nice features like frequency scanning and so on. So these units here are RF-based microphones.
Moving all over from there is our IR800 series, uh, which is infrared. So again, uh, there's version there for handheld and uh, bell pack style microphones, as there are with these, and we'll kind of go through those options in the next slide, whether it's handheld or again, uh, headset style microphones, but we'll cover that in a moment. So again, this is infrared, so this is confined to the room. So again, maybe corporate boardroom, they need, uh, and, and their meeting room, they need uh, a wireless microphone there for meetings, but they, they're worried about anybody picking up infrared's a good solution, as well in is in a uh, classroom voice lift, infrared comes into play. Look at styles of microphones. TWA does have a very vast offering when it comes to styles of microphones and options. Have a look at our website, there's a nice wireless brochure guide when it comes to uh, our wireless offering. Any questions, you can definitely talk to your local uh, TOA integration partner, RSM's real sales manager, or call TOA Tech Support and they can help you in the, in the selection. But as you see, we have a full, we do have a full wide range of handouts. I'm showing you one, but we have multiple different styles depending on what series it's in, whether it's the Trantex or the 5000 series, 5.3, so our various styles of microphone are handheld that way as well as the usage. And what's nice when you look at some of our brochures, it'll show you for speech, for vocal. So one may be, you know, because of the style, whether it's condenser or whether it's a Deneg microphone and polar pattern, it'll help you, uh, it'll kind of put you the right way, say this is for talking or this is for singing. So that information is in some of our brochures, so nice offering that way. Full range of various labs, and these labs nearly are uh, condenser based, but some are are uh, dynamic, and they do have options for pickup patterns. So again, they'll have omni mount or sorry, omni directional or unidirectional pickup patterns available. These style of microphones, uh, one thing we won't point, we'll go into a belt pack style, so they plug into here. So that's your transmitter. Transmitter of the handheld built into the microphone, so it's really microphone transmitter. And here we have the tr transmitter on its own. And you can choose what microphone you want to connect to it. One thing to keep in mind is within this various series of microphones, some like, sometimes the connector is different. So please note that when you look at them or ask the question, because uh, some of them are a mini jack, some of them are a mini XLR, so sometimes the connection to the belt pack may be different. Full range of uh, headset style microphones. We have very slim, we'll call them the TSN microphone or sports broadcaster microphone. Very popular in the house of wars, they fit nicely behind your ear, lightweight and so on. You barely know that it's, it's you're wearing it, so it's not too uncomfortable. They're that style, and again, it, it's positioned so it get very close to your mouth, so it can be a cardio style microphone, so less uh, susceptible to feedback and good pickup uh, of the person that, that's speaking. A headset more wraparound style microphone, uh, condenser style, uh, all, you know, some other options here. One that's quite popular too is uh, an aerobic style microphone, so a little bit more robust for, for the abuse that you might have when it's doing aerobics or a gym, uh, you know, gymnasium school teacher, that type of thing. Also, potentially be moisture resistant, so you know, if someone that is sweating and so on, it's less susceptible to damage for that. So, there's some environmental concerns that you'll want to uh, bring up or look at when choosing a certain head st style microphone as well. Some other accessories that go with the wireless side of things is we have charger bases. A lot of times, people don't think to look at this, but uh, when, when your batteries are constantly dead or you forget about it or, you're, you know, again, you're trying to do your part green environment-wise, uh, reducing your batteries and uh, things like that, you know, having charger bases are really nice. So there are options for those, whether it's a dual bay, an 8 bay or 16 bay charger. Uh, most of the microphones allow that, uh, allow that f functionality. Some of the inter-level units do not. So it's one of the things to double check that it is uh, charger approved. One key thing uh, to also understand is, as I mentioned, infrared does go through walls, but it's not going to go through every wall. Or sorry, RF will go through walls, but it's not going to go through every wall. So there are options for remote mounted antennas. So, so if you look at it again, I'm going to use a school or a, a hotel presentation type multi-purpose 
scenario uh, uh, installation where the rack is sorry, located in a different room than where the microns is going to be used. It's hit or miss depending on the distance of what those walls are made of whether that microphone's transmission is going to get the receiver. So it's always a good idea to potentially look at remote mounted antennas that can go in the room that the microphones are being used. Then they run back to the rack location where the gear is going to be. So, you know, when in doubt, uh, you know, it's something you may want to look at as an option or talk to your, your, your local dealer integrator or again, call us and, you know, we can make the suggestion whether that's needed or not. Generally, if the receiver for the microphone is within the room you're using, you don't have to worry about it. But again, it's something it's a discussion you want to have uh, to make sure that you don't get dropout because of the environment and the installation. So there are options for antennas for our systems as well. When looking at our website, I won't spend too much on these point things, but again, this is taken from our brochure. So uh, you'll look at you know the different model numbers of microphones that are available. So it'll go through the channels that are available that can be used at one time within that range. It'll help make suggestions, as I mentioned, for vocal or presentation. And within them, you also have different options of, of microphone style. And, and here we've got different options for your bell pack transmitter and or the loud there microphone. So there's a nice guide on our wireless brochure via our website at TOA Canada. Example of here of more hands-free, so on, so we get headset style kits. And you can, most of our lines, you can buy them a la carte, so you can pick the receiver, the microphone transmitter, as well as the microphone itself. But there are pre, pre set up kits too. So we have a, maybe an aerobic kit or a handheld kit or a lab layer style kit. So there are kits that include all three parts. And they are aligned in this brochure, brochure as well. Going up, been, uh, back on this, you have the sports aerobic style microphones, again, that are a little bit more robust. They may have an arm pouch that the instructor could put onto their arm, put the transmitter in there, and again, you know, it's going to be more robust. The wire that connect to the microphone itself can handle a little bit more, uh, more abuse. Getting near the end here, I did mention the, the infrared option for microphones. Where we're seeing the most growth, growth of infrared is infrared wireless classroom systems. This is our IR800 wireless microphone, uh, I guess, audio reinforcement kit. So where this is, what this is designed for is for the school application for voice lip in classroom. So we have infrared wireless options here, a dedicated handheld, a dedicated lanyard style microphone that hangs around your neck. Uh, then we have the combination unit here that can be a handheld or it could be uh, one that hangs around your neck. So, you know, this could, the teacher would have generally, you know, the style that goes on a lanyard and you could also have a handheld or the style that the student would pass around. That in turn connects to a mixer unit here, which uh, controls your two microphones and goes to an amplified speaker. One thing to note in infrared style systems, their, their infrared transmitters go to an infrared receiver. So there is going to be a box that picks up the transmission of the infrared somewhere on that ceiling. In this case, in our infrared classroom systems built into the speaker, uh, again, we do have standalone out cart units where there are separate receivers for the infrared from the system itself. <coughs> Excuse me. So kind of close it up here, we're getting close to our hour point. Uh, the one thing, a lot of information uh, we went through there, hope it was good and, and um, was worth your time. The key point is regardless of your application, wired or wireless, TV has a solution uh, that you're looking for. So don't hesitate to uh, contact your local regional sales manager.